Hi everybody, this is Pastor Joshua Sullivan. Welcome back to Ask the Pastor. Today we've got a question about tulip. Not the flower, but about five-point Calvinism. Someone asks, Hi Pastor Sullivan, I've got a somewhat a set of somewhat interrelated questions for you. I'm basically wondering what are your thoughts on Calvinism, specifically the doctrines of grace, the five points, tulip. Would you consider yourself and Lutheran doctrine to be a one-point Calvinist, just the T, or more? Which ones do Lutherans agree with? Also, I assume you believe in single predestination. How does that work logically and scripturally, especially in light of Romans chapter 9? Thanks so much. These are interrelated questions, but I want to do them both justice. So I, here's what I propose to do. In this video, I'm going to talk about TULIP, the five points of Calvinism. Uh, and in the next video, then we'll delve into Romans chapter 9 and talk about specifically more about single versus double predestination. Then. So what are our thoughts on TULIP? Well, for those of you that don't know, TULIP is an acronym to uh, define the five points of Calvinism. The T of TULIP stands for total depravity. By total depravity, what Calvinists mean is that we are totally depraved. There is no part of human nature, there is no part of human beings that has escaped sin. Because sin is transferred from parent to child, uh, like David says, Psalm 51, verse 5, In sin did my mother conceive me. Uh, there is no part of us that is unsullied by sin. Human reason, human intellect, human will, everything is totally depraved. Everything is sinful. There's not a spark of goodness in us. There's not, uh, you know, some, some religions or so, some portions of Christianity are going to teach that our will is not entirely fallen so that we can make a decision for Jesus. Um, that is on one end, um, you know, uh, Arminian Protestantism. It is on another side, um, semi-medieval Roman Catholicism. But total depravity, we're going to have to agree with the Calvinists on this one, uh, that we are irrevocably sinful. And we cannot, by our own reason or strength, uh, come to Jesus Christ or, or have him as Lord, but rather it has to be the Holy Spirit who works in our hearts through his means of grace. Then, Now, that's the T. U. Uh, U in TULIP stands for unconditional election. By unconditional election, what the Calvinist means is that from eternity, before the creation, God decreed, God made an absolute decree that these people, are going to be elect. I have elected or chosen these people for salvation. And that's scriptural. Uh, however, Calvin also then taught a, a double predestination. There's a dark side, another side of that coin, in which if God has predestined people to salvation, therefore he has also predestined people to perdition or to damnation, to hell then. This is an arbitrary decree, unconditional election, and so it's in view of nothing. Uh, it's strictly these are the people I'm choosing for heaven. These are the people I'm cho choosing for hell and eternal torment. And that's it. Now, we, we agree with this. We, we agree with the one, the, the election to life, the election to salvation. We don't agree with the election to perdition or the election to damnation. And the real short answer for this is whenever in the scriptures election is spoken of, it's always spoken of as being, we are elected in Christ. Uh, we are elected uh, for the sake of faith. We are elected for salvation. The scripture never specifically mentions that people are elected by God from eternity for perdition, for damnation. We wanna get more to that in the next video because the only verse in my, to my knowledge uh, that even remotely can be interpreted that is Romans chapter 9, 22 and 23. We will take a look at that in our next video though. So without condition, you know, God has elected some to heaven and God has elected others to hell. So that's one in which we can't necessarily agree uh, because we don't go for a double predestination. The L in TULIP then is limited atonement. And by this, it's exactly what it says. It's that the atonement that Christ procured on the cross was limited to the elect to those who were arbitrarily chosen from eternity then. Now, there are some Calvinists who will try to smooth that over and say, well, the effects of the atonement are only for the elect. Um, but from what I've read of Calvin, uh, which now isn't the extensive work of his corpus, but just a, a smattering of it is that the, the, the atonement is limited to those whom God elected. And the reason is, is this is, it's, it's really logical, this system. If some are unconditionally elected to hell and damnation, then why in the world would God waste his time atoning for their sins if he's already decided that they're going to be damned? So it, it makes sense 
in this in its weird way. So of course we're going to disagree with this because the scripture says, St. John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. St. John also says in the second chapter of his first epistle that Jesus Christ is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for our sins, but for the sins of the entire world. He doesn't say just for the elect, but for the entire world. Then. Now, the atonement is the atonement is for the sins of the entire world. And then how do you enjoy the benefits of that atonement? It can only be applied to you when you believe. And so that's where justification by faith comes in then. The atonement is procured or acquired, and then it is applied by faith. But as far as you know, limiting atonement to only those um, whom God elected, no, we can't get on board for that. The I in TULIP then, <clears throat> excuse me, stands for irresistible grace. And what they mean by this is, since God has elected you, let's just say God's elected you in this scheme, uh, to eternal life, to salvation, etc., then, when God converts you, with or without the word of God, uh, when God converts you, then you can't resist that. Boom, he's going to get you, and then you're in. You cannot resist it. This also is contrary to the scriptures, because the scriptures say very clearly that you can fall away from the faith. Now, uh, think, for instance, in 1 Corinthians, where Paul tells them, let anyone who thinks he is standing firm take heed lest he fall. Why would he say that if you can't fall from faith? Another thing to consider is St. Paul in Corinthians where he writes that he himself pummels his body and brings it into subjection lest he disqualify himself from salvation. This is St. Paul writing this. If St. Paul is surely among the elect, but yet he's saying, I have to discipline my body. I have to fight sin. I have to mortify my own sinful flesh. Otherwise, I could very well disqualify myself from everlasting life. So is grace irresistible? Not according to the scriptures. God gives his, God, God gives his gospel. He preaches his gospel to many. And many say, no, nah, I don't have anything to do with that. They have no problem resisting that. The Calvinists would say, well, they're just not elect, and that's why they're not hearing. But we see in the, in the apostle that he himself disciplines himself lest he disqualify himself, and lest he judge himself unworthy of everlasting life. The P of Tulip, then, is the perseverance of the saints. And what this means in a nutshell is that if God has elected you from eternity by his sovereign will, and if God has atoned for your sins, and if God has given you his irresistible grace, you cannot disqualify yourselves. The I and the P, the irresistible grace and the perseverance of the saints, uh, really go together. Uh, because if God gives you his grace and it's irresistible, then you're, if you're unable to resist it, you're not going to fall away. You will persevere in the faith until life everlasting in the end. Uh, so they're eternally secure in that, and often when the flesh hears that, they see license to sin and license to live however they want to. Now Calvin and his followers and his adherents were very quick, and very, and they said this very often, that that is not what we were teaching. We're not teaching that because you're saved, therefore you can go out and do whatever you want to. But what they were teaching was that once you have been saved, you cannot fall away. And so we see where that sort of thing leads. So as far as tulip Calvinism is concerned, we really only agree with the T of tulip Calvinism. Would I call Lutherans one-point Calvinists? No. Uh, I would just say that Calvin got one out of five right then. Now, like I said, we'll talk about predestination more in the next video, uh, but it's important that we have a, a good understanding of these because there are Calvinists, uh, you know, folks uh, who are holding to Calvinistic teaching, and so it's, it's important that we hear things, when, we, when excuse me, we hear things like unconditional election, we remember, okay, they're not just saying that people are appointed to everlasting life, but also they are appointed uh, unconditionally to eternal perdition as well. So, yeah, we would go along with T of TULIP, total depravity, but not the unconditional election, not the limited atonement, not irresistible grace, and not the perseverance of the saints, at least not in the way that Calvin taught it then. So that's our look of TULIP. We'll see you in our next video where we'll talk about double predestination, especially in light of Romans chapter 9, verses 22 and 23. We'll see you then.